A reading from A Warning to Professors by Jonathan Edwards. That they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands. And with their idols have they committed adultery. And have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Moreover this they have done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they had slain their children to their idols, and they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. Ezekiel 23, verse 37, 38, and 39. Subject. When they that attend ordinances of divine worship allow themselves a known wickedness, they are guilty of dreadfully profaning and polluting those ordinances. Samaria and Jerusalem or Israel and Judah, are here represented by two women, Ahola and Aholava, and their idolatry and treachery towards their covenant God is represented by the adultery of these women. They forsook God, who was their husband and the guide of their youth, and prostituted themselves to others. The baseness of Ahola and a holaba towards God her husband is here pointed out by two things, namely adultery and bloodshed. They have committed adultery and a blood is in their hands. First, they committed adultery with other lovers, namely with their idols. With their idols have they committed adultery. Number two. They not only committed adultery, but they took their children that they bore to God and killed them for their lovers. Their hearts were quite alienated from God. Their husband and they were so bewitched with lust after those other lovers that they took their own children, whom they had by their husband, and put them to cruel death to make a feast with them for their lovers. As it is said in verse 37, and have also caused my sons whom they bear unto me to pass for them through the fire to devour them. But here is the twofold wickedness of those actions of theirs held forth to us in the words first. The wickedness of them considered in themselves. For who can express the horrid baseness of this their treatment of God, their husband, second, an additional wickedness resulting from the joining of these actions with sacred things. Besides the monstrous wickedness of these actions in themselves considered, there was this which exceedingly increased the guilt, that on the same day they came into God's sanctuary, or that they lived in such wickedness at the same time that they came and attended the holy ordinances of God's house, pretending to worship and adore him, whom they all the while treated in such a horrid manner. And so herein defiled and profaned, holy things, as in verses 38 and 39, moreover, this have they done to me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbaths. For when they have slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. Doctrine. When they that attend ordinances of divine worship allow themselves a known wickedness, they are guilty of dreadfully profaning and polluting those ordinances. By a divine ordinance, when the expression is used in its greatest latitude, is meant anything of divine institution or appointment. Thus we call marriage a divine ordinance, because it was appointed by God. So civil government is called an ordinance of God, Romans 13, verses 1 and 2. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. But the word is more commonly used only for an instituted or appointed way or mean of worship. So the sacraments 
or ordinances. So public prayer, singing of praise, the preaching of the word and the hearing of the word preached are divine ordinances. The setting apart of certain officers in the church, the appointed way of discipline, public confession of scandals, admonition, and excommunication are ordinances. These are called the ordinances of God's house or of public worship. And these are intended in the doctrine. It is a profanation of these ordinances that is spoken of in the text. They came into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house, says God. This doctrine seems to contain two propositions. Section 1. The ordinances of God are holy. Divine ordinances are holy in the following respects. First, they are conversant wholly and immediately about God and things divine. When we are in the attendance on the ordinances of divine worship, we are in the special presence of God. When persons come and attend on the ordinances of God, they are said to come before God and to come into his presence. Jeremiah 7 verse 10. Come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, Psalm 100, verse 2. Come into his presence with singing. In divine ordinances, persons have immediate intercourse with God, either in applying to him, as in prayer and singing praises, or in receiving from him, waiting solemnly and immediately on him for spiritual good as in hearing the word, or in both applying to God and receiving from him as in the sacraments. They were appointed on purpose that in them men might converse and hold communion with God. We are poor, ignorant, blind worms of the dust, and God did not see it meet that our way of intercourse with him should be left to ourselves. But God has given us his ordinances as ways and means of conversing with him. In these ordinances, holy and divine things are exhibited and represented. In the preaching of the word, holy doctrines and the divine will are exhibited. In the sacraments are represented our faith, love, and obedience. Number two. The end of God's ordinances is holy. The immediate end is to glorify God. They are instituted to direct us in the holy exercises of faith and love, divine fear and reverence, submission, thankfulness, holy joy and sorrow, holy desires, resolutions and hopes. True worship consists in these holy and spiritual exercises And as these divine ordinances are the ordinances of worship, they are to help us and to direct us in such worship as this. Number three, they have the sanction of divine authority. They are not only conversant about a divine and holy object and designed to direct and help us in divine and holy exercises, but they have a divine and holy author. The infinitely great and holy God has appointed them, the eternal three in one. Each person in the Trinity has been concerned in their institution. God the Father has appointed them, and that by his own Son. They're of Christ's own appointment, and he appointed as he had received of the Father, John 12, verse 49. I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment what I should say, and what I should speak. And the Father and Son more fully revealed and ratified them by the Spirit, and they are committed to writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They are holy, and that God has hallowed them or consecrated them. They are conversant about holy things. And God ordained them that in them we might be conversant about holy things. They are for a holy use. And it is God who by his own immediate authority ordained them for that holy use, which renders them much more sacred than otherwise they would have been. Number four, they are attended in the name of God. 
Thus we are commanded to do all that we do in word or deed in the name of Christ, Colossians 3, verse 17, which is to be understood especially of our attendance on ordinances. Ordinances are administered in the name of God. When the word is preached by authorized ministers, they speak in God's name as Christ's ambassadors, as co-workers together with Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now we are ambassadors for Christ, chapter 4, verse 1. We are workers together with him. When a true minister preaches, he speaks as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. And he is to be heard as one representing Christ. So in administering the sacraments, The minister represents the person of Christ. He baptizes in his name, and in the Lord's Supper stands in his stead. In administering church censors, he still acts, as the apostle expresses it, in the person of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10. On the other hand, the congregation in their addresses to God and ordinances as prayer and praise act in the name of Christ a mediator, as having him to represent them, and as coming to God by him. Section 2. God's ordinances are dreadfully profaned by those who attend on them, and yet allow themselves in ways of wickedness. Persons who come to the house of God, into the holy presence of God, attending the duties and ordinances of his public worship, pretending with others, according to divine institution, to call on the name of God, to praise him, to hear his word, and commemorate Christ's death, and who yet, at the same time, are wittingly and allowedly going on in wicked courses, or in any practice contrary to the plain rules of the word of God, therein greatly profane the holy worship of God, defile the temple of God, and those sacred ordinances on which they attend. The truth of this proposition appears by the following considerations. Number one, by attending ordinances and yet living in allowed wickedness, they show great irreverence and contempt of those holy ordinances. When persons who have been committing known wickedness, as it were, the same day, as it is expressed into the text, and attend the sacred solemn worship and ordinances of God, and then go from the house of God directly to the like allowed wickedness, they by this express a most irreverent spirit with respect to holy things, and in a horrid manner cast contempt upon God's sacred institutions and on those holy things which are concerned with in them. They show that they have no reverence of that God who has hallowed these ordinances. They show a contempt of that divine authority which instituted them. They show a horribly irreverent spirit towards that God into whose presence they come, and with whom they immediately have to do in ordinances, and in whose name these ordinances are performed and attended. They show a contempt of the adoration of God, of that faith and love, and that humiliation, submission, and praise, which ordinances were instituted to express. What an irreverent spirit does it show that they are so careless after what manner they come before God, that they take no care to cleanse and purify themselves in order that they may be fit to come before God, Yea, that they take no care to avoid making themselves more and more unclean and filthy. They have been taught many a time that God is of a purer eye than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity, and how exceedingly he is offended with sin. Yet they do not care how unclean and abominable they come into his presence. It shows horrid irreverence and contempt that they are so bold that they are not afraid to come into the presence of God in such a manner, and that they will presume to go out of the presence of God and from an attendance upon holy things, again to their sinful practices. If they had any reverence of God and holy things, 
an approach into his presence, and an attendance on those holy things, would leave that awe upon their minds, that they would not dare to go immediately from them to their ways of known wickedness. It would show a great irreverence in any person towards a king, if he should not care how we came into his presence, and if he should come in a sordid habit, and in a very indecent manner. How much more horrid irreverence does it show for persons willingly and allowedly to defile themselves with that filth which God infinitely hates, and so frequently come into the presence of God. Number two, by making a show of respect to God in ordinances, and then acting the contrary in their lives, they do but mock God. In attending ordinances, they make a show of respect to God by joining in prayer, in public adorations, confessions, petitions, and thanksgivings. They make a show of high thoughts of God and of humbling themselves before Him, of sorrow for their sins, of thankfulness for mercies, and of a desire of grace and assistance to obey and serve God. By attending upon the hearing of the word, they make a show of a teachable spirit and of a readiness to practice according to the instructions given. By attending on the sacraments, they make a show of faith in Christ, of choosing him for their portion and spiritually feeding upon him. But by their actions, they all the while declare the contrary. They declare that they have no high esteem of God but that they despise him in their hearts. They declare that they are so far from repenting of, that they intend to continue in their sins. They declare that they have no desire of that grace and assistance to live in a holy manner for which they prayed, and that they would rather live wickedly. This is what they choose, and for the present are resolved upon. They declare by their actions that there is no truth in what they pretend in hearing the word preached, that they had a desire to know what the will of God is, that they might be directed in their duty. For they declare by their actions that they desire not to do the will of God, and that they do not intend any such thing, but intend on the contrary to disobey him and that they preferred their carnal interest before his authority and glory. They declare by their actions that there is not truth in what they pretend in their attendance on the sacraments, that they desire to be fed with spiritual nourishment and to be conformed and assimilated to Christ and have communion with him. They show by their practices that they have no regard to Christ and that they had rather have their lusts gratified than to be fed with the spiritual food. Show that they desire not any assimilation to Christ, but to be different from him, and of an opposite character to him. They show that instead of desiring communion with Christ, they are his resolved and allowed enemies, willfully acting the part of enemies to Christ, dishonoring him and promoting the interest of Satan against him. God sees men's designs and resolutions more plainly than we can see their outward actions. Therefore, for a man to pray to God to be kept from sin, and at the same time to intend to sin as mockery, is visible to God as if he prayed to be kept from some particular sin, which he was at the same time willingly and allowedly committing. These persons are guilty of a horrid profanation of God's ordinances, for they make them occasions of a greater affront to God, the occasions of showing their impudence and presumption. For he who lives in willful wickedness and does not enjoy the ordinances of God is not guilty of so great presumption as he who attends these ordinances and yet allows himself in wickedness. This latter acts as though he came into the presence of God on purpose to affront him. He comes from time to time to hear the will of God, and all the while designs disobedience, and goes away and acts directly contrary to it. A call to self-examination. Let this doctrine put all upon examining themselves, whether they do not allow themselves in known wickedness. 
you are such as do enjoy the ordinances of divine worship. You come into the holy presence of God, attending on those ordinances which God by sacred authority has hallowed and set apart, that in them we might have immediate intercourse with himself, that we might worship and adore him and express to him a humble, holy, supreme respect and that in them we might receive immediate communications from him. Here you come and speak to God, pretending to express your sense how glorious he is, and how worthy that you should fear and love him, humble yourselves before him, devote yourselves to him, obey him, and have a greater respect to his commands and to his honor than to any temporal interest, ease, or pleasure of your own. Here you pretend before God that you are sensible how unworthily you have done by sins committed in times past, and that you have a great desire not to do the like in time to come. You pretend to confess your sins and to humble yourselves for them. Here you pray that God would give you his spirit to assist you against sin, to keep you from the commission of it enable you to overcome temptations and help you to walk holy in all your conversation, as though you really had a great desire to avoid such sins as you have been guilty of in time past. And the like pretenses you have made in your attendance upon the other ordinances, as in hearing the word and singing praise and so on. But consider whether you do not horribly defile and profane the public prayers and other ordinances, notwithstanding all your pretenses, And what you seem to hold forth by your attendance on them, do you not all the while live in known wickedness against God? For all your pretenses of respect to God, of humiliation for sin, and desires to avoid it, have you not come directly from the allowed practice of known sin to God's ordinances, and did not at all repent of what you had done, nor at all be sorry for it at the very time when you stood before God, making these pretenses, and even had no design of reformation, but intended to return to the same practice again after your departure from the presence of God? Persons very often deal very perversely in pretending that the sins in which they live are not known sins. Nothing is more common, surely, than for persons to flatter themselves with this concerning the wickedness in which they live. Let that wickedness be almost what it may, they will plead to their consciences and endeavor to steal them, that there is no evil in this. Men's own consciences can best tell how they are wont to do in this matter. There is hardly any kind of wickedness that men commit, but they will plead thus in excuse for it. They will plead thus about their cheating and injustice, about their hatred of their neighbors, about their evil speaking, about their revengeful spirit about their excessive drinking, about their lying, their neglect of secret prayer, their lasciviousness, their unclean dalliances. Yea, they will plead excuses for very gross acts of uncleanness, as fornication, adultery, and what not. They have their vain excuses and carnal reasonings in favor of all their evil actions. They will say, what harm, what evil is there in such and such an action? And if there be a plain rule against it, Yet they will plead that their circumstances are peculiar, and that they are accepted from the general rule, that their temptation is so great that they are excusable, or something will they find to plead. It was the saying of one, we all perish by lawful things, which is as much as to say men commonly live wickedly and go to hell in those ways which they flatter themselves that they are sins of ignorance. They do not know them to be unlawful. Thus I make no doubt some will be apt to do in applying to themselves this use of examination, if they can be persuaded to apply it to themselves at all. Whether these things be true of you, let your consciences speak. You that neglect secret prayer, you that indulge in an inordinate appetite for strong drink, you that defraud or oppress others, you that indulge a spirit of revenge and hatred toward your neighbor. It is in vain for you to pretend that those are sins of ignorance of which you would not dare to proceed in the practice if you knew that your soul was to be required of you this night. Persons do many things for which they plead and pretend they think there is no evil in them. 
who yet would as soon as eat fire as do the same if they knew that they were to stand before the judgment seat of Christ within 24 hours.